Hi guys, you're all very welcome back to Three Minute Tales. This is the She Bean, and I'm your storyteller, Shanna Key. Now, thankfully, you might say that this intro is going to be a little bit shorter than normal because the story is it's a little bit longer than three minutes. Uh, but it's just dedicated to all the animal lovers and the pet lovers out there. Let's face it, we've all been there. You get a little pet as a child and you think it's going to live forever and you fall in love with it and then it passes away. But this story, it's a little bit different. It caught me off guard, but it's a beautiful tale. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to leave a comment if you'd like down below and keep on hitting that subscribe button. The subscriptions are coming in fast and thick and it's fantastic and thank you so much. So until the next time, I'm Shanna Key. In 1940, Rosie Barnes was only six years old when she, along with her older sister, Victoria, were evacuated from their home in London's West End. Fearing civilian casualties from constant air raids by the German forces, Rosie and 10-year-old Victoria were part of the government-sanctioned Operation Pied Piper that saw thousands of children being evacuated from large English cities to the safety of more rural parts of Great Britain. After a train and bus journey of almost four hours, Rosie and Victoria found themselves in the care of middle-aged couple Leonard and Barbara Wood at their farm in St. Levin in Cornwall. Leonard was a farmer and part-time blacksmith with a love for animals and nature. His wife Barbara was a kindly woman who helped him look after the farm and tend to their livestock. The couple who were childless immediately heaped affection and attention on the two young sisters. Victoria, being older, settled into their new life quickly, but Rosie, who was a very quiet child, found it hard to adjust. She missed her parents, particularly her mother, who she was very close to, and of course her father, who was in France fighting for his king and country. Rosie and Victoria were enrolled in a nearby school where Victoria made friends with a number of other children, some of whom were also evacuees. However, as the weeks went by, Rosie became more withdrawn, which worried Leonard and Barbara. The couple would hear her cry at night in her bedroom, but no matter how much reassurance they gave her, Rosie continued to fret for her mother. After almost five months in Cornwall and with Rosie's birthday approaching, Leonard suggested to his wife that he might buy a little pet for her to lift her spirits. And so when he suggested that he might get Rosie a pet tortoise as a birthday present, Barbara laughed heartily. When the day of Rosie's birthday eventually arrived, she was overjoyed with her new tropical pet. She named the tortoise Daisy, totally unaware that the tortoise was actually male. Immediately, Rosie seemed like a different child. With Daisy nestling in a small wooden crate beside her bed every night, she now began to sleep soundly, much to the relief of Leonard and Barbara. Being a warrior, Rosie asked Leonard what might happen to Daisy if she was to escape into the countryside and be lost forever. But Leonard told her that he would make sure that if she did escape, she could be identified. Without harming the animal, he inscribed the letter D for Daisy into its shell with a coping saw and promised Rosie that he would tell everyone in the village about the inscription. And if it did escape, they would know straight away that it was Rosie's tortoise when found. This allayed any fears that Rosie had, and she was now content knowing that everyone in the village would keep a lookout for her beloved pet if it did go missing. The children grew very close to Leonard and Barbara and happily carried out small chores for the couple around the farm each day. Rosie's job was to collect eggs from the hen house every morning, and Victoria was more than happy to feed the six pigs that were kept in a sty at the back of the farmhouse. Barbara helped the two young sisters write long letters each week to their mother back home in London, and when they received replies to their letters, Barbara would read them to the delighted girls at bedtime. As the months turned into years, the two young sisters grew to love the new home and even developed thick Cornish accents, much to the amusement of Leonard and Barbara. They also grew very close to the Woods' two nieces, Jessie and Clarissa, who lived nearby. Every Christmas, the family would celebrate together with a traditional turkey dinner and the entire extended Cornish family would party into the early hours to the excitement of Rosie, Victoria, Jessie and Clarissa. In September 1945, a full five years after the two young sisters had arrived at St. Levin, 
Barbara informed the girls that the war had ended. With mixed emotions, she told them that they could return to their home in London as soon as it was safe to do so. The two girls were left feeling compromised. They had grown to love their foster parents, the farm animals, their new cousins and friends, but also yearned to see their mother and father. It took a further four months before the Home Office allowed the children to return to their native cities and towns. One of Rosie's huge concerns was that of Daisy, her tortoise. Officials would not allow her to bring her beloved tortoise with her. So Leonard promised her that he would take care of Daisy for her. And when the girls returned to visit them every year as planned, she could see her pet every day. On the 21st of January 1946, at the Penzance bus depot, a broken-hearted Leonard and Barbara waved goodbye to Rosie and Victoria as their bus pulled away bound for London. The couple's farmhouse now felt empty and eerily quiet without the two young sisters, but they both found solace knowing that the two girls would visit them again when they could. Back in London, the girls slowly adjusted back into life and the hustle and bustle of the city. Their father had arrived safely back from the war and the family resumed their lives as best they could. Rosie boasted to her schoolmates about her time in Cornwall and told them all about Leonard, Barbara and Daisy the Tortoise to the envy of her friends. Within months of the girls' return, Charlie Barnes, the young girl's father, had convinced his wife Ada that they should join his brother in New York and emigrate to the United States. Before long, the young family found themselves living in a small house in Jackson Heights in the borough of Queens in New York. Charlie found work as a carpenter and his wife and two daughters soon settled into the American way of life. As the years passed, the girls' experience in Cornwall was a distant memory. They both grew up and finished high school before they both found employment working at Macy's flagship department store in Manhattan. After lengthy relationships, both young women married two native New Yorkers but remained living near their parents and raised nine children between them. Although Victoria rarely thought of Cornwall and their experience there, Rosie often spoke fondly of her time spent with Leonard and Barbara Wood. Her husband and children joked about knowing the stories inside out, having heard them so often from Rosie. As Rosie and her husband Jimmy prepared to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary, their banker son Jimmy Jr. surprised his parents with a present of a holiday to England to mark the momentous occasion. Rosie hadn't set foot on English soil since she and her family left for the United States 64 years earlier and was very excited at the prospect of seeing her hometown again. On hearing about her sister's trip back to England, Victoria and her husband Mike decided to join the couple on their trip back to London and on the 23rd of August all four flew from JFK Airport to Heathrow Airport in London. After a week exploring the city, they decided for all time's sake to embark on the 300 mile trip to St. Levin. Now aged in their mid to late 70s, the two couples booked a small charter flight to Penzance and found themselves back in Cornwall. After checking into a bed and breakfast in the town, they ordered a taxi to bring them to St. Levin, where they hoped to find the farm of Leonard and Barbara Wood. Unsure as to the directions, they asked the taxi driver if he might know of the farm. Amazingly he did, and drove the short distance to the old farmhouse. To Rosie and Victoria's surprise, the farmhouse was exactly as they had remembered it. It had been modernised and extended slightly, but it still looked exactly the same. Urged on by their husbands, the two women approached the house and knocked on the door. It was opened by none other than Clarissa Harkin, the now elderly niece of Leonard and Barbara Wood. The house had been left to her in their will, and when they both passed away in the 1970s, she, along with her husband and three children, had taken up residence in the old farmhouse. They were welcomed into the house by Clarissa, who was astonished at the arrival of her two adopted cousins from over 60 years ago. They spoke for almost two hours, reminiscing about their time spent with Leonard and Barbara Wood during the war. When Victoria joked about Rosie's pet tortoise, Daisy, Clarissa laughed uncontrollably. I have a surprise for you, she said, before leading Rosie, Victoria and their husbands into the back room of the house. In a large glass fish tank in the corner of the room sat a tortoise with the letter D engraved on its shell. Unbelievably, Rosie's pet was still alive and grazing on some carrots and lettuce leaves, happy and content as it had been in 1940. 
She had never imagined that her pet could still be alive after all these years. But incredibly, Leonard had kept his promise of taking care of the tortoise. And when he passed away, his niece Clarissa had adopted a reptile. Rosie cried with joy as she petted and kissed her long lost pet for the first time in 64 years. When Clarissa passed away in 2016, Daisy the tortoise was adopted by her daughter Jennifer, where she still lives with her and her family to this day in St. Levin at the ripe old age of 80.